Hi, my name is Patrick Sullivan, and I've written a corollary to the Kaluza Klein theorem. Mass absorption as a mechanism to access the fifth dimension. It concerns the physics of torque in a field of engineering that is known as static field engineering. For the last 200 years or so, it has been common knowledge that the static fields are generally not accessible for the extraction of electrical energy or heat. Uh, the static fields themselves are actually zero point fields and they are also planetary inertial fields. And the Kaluza Klein theorem, which was presented in 1938, gives a direction and understanding of uh, answering the technical question is where is the torque developed? If we look at a windmill, we can see right away that we can access our torque where we fasten it to the earth. That is our main torquing point. The question with the planet, where is the torquing point? Because we are in motion with the planet. In a little bit of the mathematical background, for thousands of years, mathematics was involved with three dimensions forward, backward, up, down, left, right. Those would be our three dimensions length, width, and height. In 1824 the fourth dimension was invented, created, divine, or discovered by a German mathematician by the name of August Mobius. And this fourth dimension was used later in the century in relativistic physics. In 1919 to 1921, Theodore Kaluza developed the fifth dimension mathematically. And later in the 1920s, Oscar Klein, a theoretical physicist, the son of a Swiss rabbi, applied calculus to this fifth dimensional uh, mathematics of Kaluza, and they came up with the Kaluza Klein theorem. And what they identified is the torquing point in accessing the cosmological process for heat and electrical energy. This is the work that Tesla was involved in and Dr. Morey and it explains where the energy is being extracted from in all these over unity machines that we are seeing now. It also explains where the energy is being developed with HHO gas. These are all static field technology. What is happening in brief is that when a particle is accelerated, it absorbs mass. As it becomes more massive, the clock rate varies. It, it contracts time and space. This is a basis of what we would call relativistic physics. And it is more than a theoretical aspect. This is actually a proven fact and it was first proven in the laboratory in 1948. It was proven in 1941 by measuring the speed of particles that were entering the Earth's atmosphere. Since this time it has been proven repeatedly that when a particle is accelerated its clock rate varies. Now if we take the clues of Klein theorem with the fifth dimension, an explanation of that. If an individual were to stand on the back of a pickup truck that was moving down the street, they would still have their three-dimensional motion up, down, left, right, forward, back. Now the truck that they are riding on becomes their fourth dimension. In this instance, the roadway itself becomes the fifth dimension. If you were to take a wheel with a rubber traction device on it and a hook and hook it onto the bumper of the pickup truck and then torque it down into the roadway you would be producing by a frictional effect on the roadway which would be your fifth dimension. So you'd be producing torque between the fourth and the fifth dimension. Producing torque at the plane of the dimension according to Kalu's climb. Now in planetary motion we are in motion at 18 and a half miles per second, which is approximately about a little over an inch per millionth of a second, per microsecond. And the other 
aspect with the planet, there is no frictional point. So that was understood in 1938. So where is the torque developed? And here's where the mass absorption enters the picture. By accelerating your electron, if you can accelerate it to 60% the speed of light, the clock rate will run at 80% of its original clock rate. So therefore, your nucleus that remains non-accelerated, that would be sitting in your machine, your motor, your heater, whatever the device is, will move in five millionths of a second, five microseconds, five inches. When you accelerate the electron to 60% the speed of light, when it returns, it will have a clock rate of 80%. So it will show four microseconds. And in four microseconds, it will have moved four inches through the space-time continuum. Now your nucleus that remains in your machine, whether, whether it be a motor or a heater, it remains it has moved five inches. Your electron now has only moved four inches. Your nucleus wants to roll or become destabilized or torque. Now your static fields that are normally considered non-accessible for energy, heat, or electricity will pour energy in as the nucleus attempts to torque at the plane of the dimension as Kaluza Klein had spoken of. What has happened is when you accelerate the electron, the mass absorption change in the clock rate has effectively accessed the fifth dimension. It has temporarily departed our inertial frame of reference and has become displaced within the time-space continuum. Now when it returns, it remains displaced, causing the destabilization of the nucleus within the static fields. These are our zero-point fields or our planetary inertial fields, they're known as also. These are all the same thing, they're static, a zero mass, not in motion. It's known today that there's 12, possibly 14 of these fields that make up the planetary inertial fields. These fields are developed from the aggregate mass of the universe. And this is the basic fundamental aspect of what Tesla had developed and Dr. Moring, which Tesla was asked, where's the energy of your machines coming from, which he did not know, but he said he was glad it was there. Dr. Moring was asked the same question. He said, I don't know, but I think it has something to do with the size of the particles. Because in the acceleration, you get a different acceleration between the nucleus, which is 3,600 mass units, and the electron, which is only one electron mass unit. So this variation of mass absorption creates a variation of time clock rate between the particles at the atomic level. And there is no friction point, of course. So it is a static field, and this is basic static field technology. Now just a little mention of HHO gas. This has never been understood where this excess energy is coming from with HHO. And how that is created is by applying electrical fields onto the molecule, the water molecule, and at the atomic level, what is happening is, is, it is changing the ground state configuration at the atomic level of the water molecules, water atom. And this water atom, when it is put into a reaction, before it can complete an ordinary chemical reaction, must first return to its original ground state configuration. In the process of doing this, it must accelerate. This acceleration produces its mass absorption and this clock rate variation. And this explains why when HHO gas is used, you can melt 13,000 degree titanium, these sorts of things, because the energy is not coming from the water molecule itself. It's coming from the burst of acceleration that is extracting it from the static fields, the planetary inertial fields. So I just wanted to introduce you to this concept of static field technology. Thank you for your time. I'm Patrick Sullivan.